I was developing the symptoms of strep throat. So I had a, a fever coming on. I had all the, you know, the broken glass in your throat. And I just realized the Holy Spirit brought it to my, gave me the revelation. I don't have to be sick. I don't have to receive this thing that's coming on me. So I got up off the couch and I walked into the bathroom and I looked at myself in the mirror. The spirit of Steve Russell was speaking to my body, the flesh of Steve Russell. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you be healed right now. All sickness and disease come out and be well in Jesus' name. And I walked away from the mirror and I went back and, and laid on the couch, still feeling lousy. But within an hour, every one of those symptoms was gone. And that was my first real prayer in expectation was on myself. How can someone speak to sickness and cause it to go away? Scripture tells us that Jesus did it routinely. Is that something that we can all do? Steve Russell will tell you that it is, and that as a believer, you have the gifts of the power of God available to you that you may not realize are already at your fingertips. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast that gives you a front row seat to the active movement and presence of God in our world. I'm Stacy McCants, and you should know that we pray for you. We pray that you hear God's voice in these conversations and that God draws you closer to Him because you're here. Steve Russell has a gift of being able to describe his own spiritual awakening in a way that helps others more clearly understand what's available to them. If you haven't heard episode 78, part one of our conversation with Steve Russell, I encourage you to go and listen to it as some of today's conversation references last week's episode. But today, Steve goes deeper as he describes his spiritual rebirth and his baptism in the Holy Spirit, which were two different occasions. He also discusses spiritual gifts intended for you that you may not even be aware of. Some of the things you hear in today's conversation may challenge some of your more traditional beliefs, and I think that's a good thing. So let's pick back up with our conversation on spiritual awakening with Steve Russell. Certainly a healthy exercise, and then you got to a place where it's like I kind of got to the end of that road. It's like, now where do I turn? Well, where do I turn if God truly is real, as it seems to be that it is in fact the case? then I need to know him. I want to know him. And yeah. so I pray another prayer, and all of a sudden, uh, a new understanding level of spirituality that exists in our world begins opening up to you. You're, you're entering new phases of faith and spirituality yeah. in a cool way. And what I'm hoping happens here is that there are people that say, man, I've always believed in God too, but I don't really understand anything about you know, creation versus science. I, can, I, can, I just have faith there. And I, yeah. I don't know about this healing stuff and prophecy and tongues and all this stuff. That sounds like the crazy church out on the highway somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Right. Right. How, how does a person begin to experience the real power of God in this world when that's all they've known in their history? That's a good question, right? Yeah. I, I think that um, what I have seen, um, and, and, and people will not want to hear this, but it's, it's the truth nonetheless. Uh, what I have seen is that those who tend to have the most free relationship with the Lord, they have the most success spiritually in, in terms of like praying for people and um you know whatever um the ones that i see that have the greatest impact are ones that had no religious upbringing of any kind because of the restrictions and the boxes that the the pre formed yeah. boxes that you place things in before yeah because what happens is when when you have been um 
when you've been brought up in um, religion, I, I use I use the the word religion in a negative context when in in the book and and just kind of in my daily vernacular. And what I mean by that, I know the I know the Bible uses religion, but um, the word religion that I refer to is man-made doctrine. Um, and another another way I describe it is formalized unbelief. And that is where you have a group of people that get together and we've decided that this is the way that we like to worship mm-hmm. and this is the way that we like to dress and we like our building to look like this. And we believe out of 100 scriptures, we believe 70 of these but these other 30 over here, we're not sure about. So 25 of them we're just going to ignore, and five of them we're going to speak against, you know. And that's, that's my view of religion in a nutshell. Right. That, that's, that's Russellology, right? Yeah. So that's Steve Russell speaking you know, yeah. from opinion uh, purely. So what happens when you grow up in that, whether it's Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, um, Presbyterian, doesn't matter, you know, in, insert a denominational name here you come to know god from the box that he has been placed in all your life and that box looks different for different people right there's lots of overlap there's you know at least 80 or 90 percent overlap from one to the other but there's always something that is not believed for in in religion um and so cessationism since we talked about that before we'll just use as as an example and i'm not trying to beat up on cessationism it's just uh, it's false so you might as well might as well shine a light on the darkness right yeah that's right so cessationism um uses experience or church history to validate their doctrine but it does not use scripture. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem, right? And that when when you come from, and I say that about cessationism, you you could use virtually any religious background to come to a place that will place a veil over your eyes to see things a certain way, and to remove that veil takes work, frankly. I mean, you have got to come to a place where I'm willing to forget everything that I learned just to know the truth of Jesus. And if you come to God with an absolute, humble, and open heart, He will expose Himself to you. He'll do it. The problem is people don't tend to do that. Uh, they're either afraid of it or they're um, a big problem that I see is is the fear of man. Uh, the fear of man will stop you from praying for somebody in the grocery store for fear of what if they don't what if nothing happens. Uh, the The fear of man will stop you from evangelism. What you know? What if they have a question that I can't answer? The fear of man will stop will get in the way of all kinds of things. But the fear of man is not for us. When we have given ourselves over in surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior, and we become born again, we have taken all things old and they have been washed away, and we have become a new creation. The Bible says that we have been bought with a price. I am not my own anymore. I've been bought with a price. And I, I try and remind myself of that scripture, actually, when I see an opportunity out in the world to, uh, to pray for somebody or to, um, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, as I call it, you know, to go out and do the work of a disciple out in the world. Um, I try and remind myself that I am not my own anymore. I am bought with a price. So it doesn't, in the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter what people think of me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't care. You don't, it, it, 
you don't care that they might think you're strange or that you are out there or that, um, is that what you're saying? If people think that I'm strange for believing the promises of God, hallelujah, let them think I'm strange. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If yeah. life's eternal, and um, I, Amen. I'm encountering more and more people who are making their investment in eternal things. Mm-hmm. Amen. Because in 150 years or 150 thousand years, uh, we're going to look back and say, "Man, that was just a that was a pretty brief breath." Why did we invest our time this way versus investing in in something that is eternal in nature? But you went from belief into relationship knowing him into a place now where you are actively living in the power and authority given to you as a follower of Jesus Christ in this world what crossed you over from not praying for healing into actually praying for healing and i'm not talking about in your room at night or in the morning Mm -hmm. you know i want to pray for sarah's cancer and i want to pray for bill's broken leg and you know pray healing over this complete healing over this and then move into but i'm talking about laying hands on go into the house yeah what bridged you from not to being an agent hunger how did it happen? Did you just start praying healing over people? Um, when I uh, when I saw the video at Joe's house and I realized that everything that I thought that I knew about the world and about Christianity was different. Uh, I won't call it wrong. It just didn't include everything. And what, what I saw was... Um, the real application of Christianity, which is to walk as Jesus walked, right? The real application of Christianity is to, um, as Scripture says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. Freely you have received, therefore freely give. So God honors faith, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. But I don't want the listener to receive that as some sort of condemnation. Oh, you mean I don't have I don't have enough faith to do this, that, or the other? That's not that's not what I mean. Personal history, personal experience, religion, all these things can get in the way. And so, what what I discovered that day in um, seeing miracles for the first time and realizing that miracles are um, a reality, Uh, that they happen not with uh, with lightning strike uh, randomness, but they happen with regularity. So what are the conditions that are created in order for miracles to happen in regularity? and in a word, it's faith. So what, for me, what happened after I saw those, the, the video and I saw miracles and I realized that um, everything's changing. <laughs> Everything that I thought I knew about Christianity has, has just changed uh, because I now see that what the Bible talks about 2,000 years ago is actually still taking place today. Just because I've never seen it before did not validate the position that it doesn't exist anymore. I had just never seen it. So once I have seen it, I can never go up, I can never go back to the place where I was before when I had not seen it. My the the veil, the veil has been torn. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the I can't go back and sew it together. I've seen the other side. So I can't unsee what I've seen. So what happened in my case? What happened was I got home from that incident and I I was just sort of dumbstruck. I I just sort of sat on it for a couple days and I told Tiffany about it and she 
didn't really, I mean, she was like, wow, that's awesome. But she didn't really connect with it because she didn't see it. She's just hearing my description of it. And so I, I was, I was talking to the Lord, uh, a couple days after I wasn't really talking to the Lord, I guess I was sitting on my bed and, and um, uh, as I recall these things, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a theme. A lot of good stuff happens when I sit on my bed and talk to the Lord. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> So, uh, for me, it's a shower. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. So for some people, it's jogging or, yeah. or riding in the car or whatever, wherever, yeah. wherever your place is that you can get quiet with the Lord. Um, it's good to do. Yeah. So, um, but I was sitting on the edge of my bed and I was just really, all of this was, was soaking into my spirit of what is, what is happening? Like I am in the discovery process of, I asked, I asked the God that created the universe to show himself to me. And he did. <laughs> like, wow. And so I'm I'm just sort of digesting all of that as I'm as I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and I, I'm going over everything that I've seen. And I'm like, wow. I get it. You are exactly who you said you are. I you I know now that there's no more, there's no more doubt for me. There's, there's no more, um, religiosity. I, I understand. I've seen it now. I've seen what, I've seen what the impossible looks like. And I start hearing all these thoughts running through my head. And, um, you'll, you'll know if you're, if you're really busy in business or if if you got a lot of things going on, you have like a to-do list that's sort of flying around your head and I got to drop the kids off at school and I got to go to the grocery store. And, you know, so I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and all these thoughts are coming, spinning around in my head. Like I got to get closer to the Lord now that I know what he's capable of and what, what he wants me to, to, to see and, and do. And he just answered a prayer last week and, and brought me into this situation where I'm and my, my head's just spinning. I'm like, where do I go to, to get more of this? I got to go somewhere to get closer to God. Do I go to Israel? God's in Israel, right? And how do I, uh, what, what happens when I go to Israel? Do I, do I get a job there? How do I work in Israel? I mean, do they, are they, do they receive outsiders to go just live there? I, I don't know. I don't know anything about, you know, and, and so all these thoughts are going through my head about getting, cl- where, where do I physically go mm-hmm. to get closer to the Lord? And I remember very clearly, because this was, this was a big moment for me, all of those voices all in, in one um, in one shot, it was it was as if a microphone had been pulled away from the voices, and they all just went, and everything got very quiet for about a second, and I heard inside my chest a voice say very clearly, "I'm right here," and it freaked me out. And it wasn't an audible voice like you hear through your eardrums in your head it came from inside my chest and i heard it in i heard it in my heart but i heard it mm-hmm. you know like i heard the voice of god say very firmly but gentle at the same time and he said i'm right here and with that, all of this noise in my head about having to go somewhere to be close to God, it just, it just left. There's no more, that, that's no longer an issue. I don't have to go to another country, to another city. I don't have to go anywhere to be closer with God. I just press ahead and seek him, seek his face. And he makes himself known. And that was... Um, that was the end of October of 2017 for me. What, um, what happened next was, um, I had a, uh, I had a desire, I guess it was, uh, it was supernatural to just sort of keep these things to, to myself between me and the Lord. And I didn't know why at the time, but I, I knew that it was, I needed some time to just digest what was what was going on. And, um, scripturally it reminded me of the time that after Jesus was baptized and the Holy spirit came on him as a dove, Mm -hmm. 
that he immediately went into the wilderness for 40 days by himself. And we know of, you know, Satan tempted him in the wilderness and, and all that. And for me, so I refer to this, this period of time um, for me as my time in the wilderness. And it's basically November and December of uh, 2017. And during that time, um, the Lord really just um, walked with me through the discovery of what repentance looks like. He walked with me through the discovery of what the importance of forgiveness and what it looks like. Um, and after I went through these things, I, I realized that Christianity is not say a prayer, get baptized, and I'll see you in 50 years. That's not what Christianity is. But what God wants is for you to surrender your house to him. Um, I remember him giving me a, a vision uh, of a, like a two-story house. And um, upstairs in one of the bedroom closets next to the snow skis and the tennis racket, is where Jesus was. And meanwhile, downstairs, I was drinking and partying and, and doing whatever. But I had a little bit of Jesus in my house, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and what the Lord showed me was, I need your whole house. I don't, I don't need to come in and just, you know, be put in the closet. I need to have free reign in your whole house. Um, and when I came to that revelation, when the Lord brought me to that revelation is, um, when, when I refer to, I call this my born again experience. Um, and it was December 28th of 2017. And it was the day that I surrendered the house. I gave the whole house to the Lord. So every aspect of me, Father, you can have my you can have my business, you can have my bank account, you can have my health, you can have my marriage, you can have my family, you can have my dogs, you can have the whole house. What do you want me to do now? And shortly after that, within within days around New Year, um, I got to I got to reflecting on the events of the previous couple of months, and and I got to thinking about TV Joshua again, and and the the miracles that I saw, and I was really struggling to uh, kind of understand um, how I was sorting I was sorting through the average Christian versus this guy that I saw doing miracles, yeah, and, and bridging the gap. Right, like how it, I, I see scripturally um, that because I go to the Father, you will do the same works that I have done, and mm-hmm. even greater that it may glorify the Father. Right, so I see that John fourteen twelve, and and I see the scriptures about uh, I will send you out to make disciples of all the nations. Right, but why isn't why aren't miracles on the news? Why isn't anyone talking about miracles? I mean, this this guy, the stuff that I saw was incredible. And people traveled from all around. So clearly they're getting this information from somewhere. They knew the, what this guy was doing enough to get on a plane and, tra- and travel. The, the guy that was in a wheelchair that got healed, he came from Switzerland. I mean, that's a big trip, you yeah. know, especially in a wheelchair. Yeah. And so, um, so I'm, I'm thinking... I wonder if there's anybody else doing this. Is there is he the only one on the planet doing this, or are there others? And um, I have to tell you that this was my this was my true discovery of YouTube, uh, because prior to that, YouTube has has been very useful for me in uh, changing out the blower motor in a dryer and changing uh, yep. the the linkage cable on my Jeep and water pipe. Yep. Yeah. All kinds of stuff, but this was when YouTube really came alive is when I did a search for healing. And I discovered that the same 
types of things that I had seen people were doing everywhere. And um, it kind of blew me away, uh, to be honest. It blew me away that I had to search for this Mm -hmm. um, rather than why isn't this stuff talked about in the church? You know, I just, I, I, it was perplexing. I, I didn't understand. Because um, skeptics can dismiss it. They can say, yeah, they didn't just stumble on that person. That was a choreographed deal where they set them up and then yeah. we did this. And, and the skeptic in us, our preconditioned mindset is that that doesn't happen. That's not real. Sure, Jesus did it way back then, but that that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And and when you were talking earlier, I feel like the Holy Spirit was giving me this. And this is where I'm at with a lot of this stuff too. And I want to get back to what you found on YouTube mm-hmm. for sure, because I've done that too. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. Is that so? So when you browse the internet on your phone or your computer or whatever else it is, and you go to websites of things that interest you. It could be that you're wanting to get a new pair of boots or, you know, your kid plays a sport. And um, so when you visit these websites, whether it's to purchase product related to your interests or to, um, you know, learn new things about those things, Mm -hmm. these websites tag you. They place a digital cookie on you as you do your search. And so when you go to your favorite websites or social media and you are fed advertisements or other content related to your searches, your experience, your browsing experience is shaped Mm -hmm. by your past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what you've done. Right. So much so that if you continue with those things, all you're going to experience is that. If you're consumed with political things, you're going to get a lot of political stuff and you're just going to live in that world. Mm-hmm. What I feel like religion has done, denominational specifically, in a lot of cases, not all cases, certainly, but in a lot of cases where we are looking to follow those things, is that. It's built up our cookies to live a certain way and to see the world in life through this particular version of it. And when God opens that veil or pulls that veil back and and you discover that that's not the truth, there's actually a different thing going on in this world. It's like you need to clear your cookies. You can can actually go into your deal and, and, and clear all your cookies. Now, you're going to get a fresh view of the internet and you're going to begin to shape it in that way but if your cookies become healing and deliverance Mm -hmm. and gifts of the spirit and the people you hang out with are also in those places that's going to become what your experience is yeah that's that's a really great analogy actually um because that is that is absolutely the way that internet search and, and social media and, and uh, as YouTube in particular works. Um, but it's also the way that religion tends to work. Right. And you gravitate towards, it's how cliques work in high school. You know, you gravitate towards um, people that you have shared interests with. Football players hang out with football players and soccer players. And, you know, you're, you're, um, your shared interest groups end up becoming your friends and becomes your lifestyle Be- and it becomes your lifestyle. Yeah. And so you and the football players, what do you do when you're like hanging out at somebody's house? Well, let's throw the football and everything's football. Let's go watch the game and right. <laughs> all right. those things. It, 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 it shades your life in that way. It, it layers that lens over the way you see things. The, the, uh, the benefit I, I spoke earlier about how I had uh, the benefit of being unchurched uh, for so long. Uh, and that was that was my my sister's moniker that she gave me, and I, I thought you know that really has been a benefit because I haven't had to work very hard to undo a bunch of religion. Um, I had the I had the seeds of it from childhood, and I mean God got me through that with apologetics largely. I mean the the bulk of the scars that I had from religion were healed over with apologetics, mm-hmm. and by the time I got through apologetics on the other side of it. 
I, I kind of had cleared my cookies, you know. I mean, I, I was sort of starting from a clean slate at that point. So you saw these YouTube videos. So I saw these YouTube videos, and and it was, uh, I mean, I remember the spring of 2018. I don't even know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos I watched. I mean, it was three or four hours a day probably of YouTube videos. What I saw in countless videos from dozens and dozens of different ministers, American, Australian, European, I saw them everywhere, African, uh, doing all the same things. They're all ministering healing. What do they do to you? Uh, the videos, there was, there was a term that I remember that was thrown around uh, called kickstart. It would be these, these conferences and seminars and stuff that they would, they would call people, come get kickstarted um, in, the, in the gifts of the Spirit and come, come get kickstarted in the Holy Spirit. And what I found that that term was just a term that was given to have people come and witness for themselves the workings of God. Mm. And um, a Kickstart event was basically you, you, you come hang out with people that had a lot of faith and were experiencing the fruits of that faith by praying for people and seeing healing and seeing deliverance, and you come around and, and watch them do it, and then they tell you to go do it, and the faith present helped to elevate your faith, and all of a sudden you're praying for people and you're seeing healing happen, right? So um, I was seeing a lot of stuff like that on YouTube that was that was happening. I was seeing people that were, for lack of a better word, getting kickstarted, and and it was just having their faith kickstarted into action. Um, and there was, of course, exposure videos that they hated stuff like that. They thought it was some sort of witchcraft or whatever. It's silly. But um, I was feeling this unction, this desire. I need to get baptized again. And I know that I was baptized when I was eight years old, but life is different now. I, I don't know. I just I, I felt um, not in a religious way, but I just felt like I wanted to get baptized again. And you felt I, born again. I felt born again, and I wanted to water baptize myself to bury the flesh along with it, you know. And so I sought out, uh, I remember there was, a, there was a website that you could, you could plug in your, uh, your zip code, and you could find um, ministers close to you that were, that were of this similar faith, right? They believed in healing. They believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They believed in deliverance. And so I wanted to find somebody uh, to baptize me. So um, I did. I, I found a guy that that lived close to come and baptize me. I got baptized in the Gulf of Mexico on uh, April twentieth of twenty eighteen. It's usually calm. Yeah, in right. April <laughs> seas aren't too rough. Yeah, it was chilly. I uh, bet it was calm. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, good. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But um, he came and and. Uh, met with me, and what I was hoping for was a baptism in water and then this crazy lightning bolt experience with the Holy Spirit that I was going to come up out of the water and I was just going to vomit out of my mouth speaking in tongues and, and all kinds of, there would be just this crazy spiritual you know, I mean, that that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really talk about wanting that, but I was, I was quietly like, man, that would be awesome, you know? And um, so I got baptized and I came up out of the water and I felt new, but I also had just like a, like a twinge of disappointment. Like I thought that it was going to be more than what it was and it was great, but I, I didn't get that lightning bolt, you know? So Richard, who uh, is, is my friend that, that baptized me, we became friends, and, and uh, he's a precious man of God. I just love him. Two days later, he, he reached out to me and he said, Hey, the Lord wanted me to talk to you about some stuff, and I think that I'm supposed to meet up with you and baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And I said, Great. Where are you right now? I want to come to where you are right now. Let's do it. And I met him. Uh, this is funny, but it, it's it's real. I met him in the Home Depot parking lot in Pace, Florida. And we 
uh, we parked way far out in the parking lot in like this corner of the parking lot where there were some trees and, and stuff and like flower bushes and trees. And, and it was actually pretty tranquil for it to be a, a, a marketplace parking lot. Yeah. Um, but he shared with me some stuff that he, he had gotten a word uh, from the Lord about me and he shared with me some revelation uh, that uh, that he felt like the Lord had given him for me. But he walked me through what the baptism of the Holy Spirit looked like. And it's all of the gifts of the Spirit are received by faith. Um, if you can pray for the gifts of the Spirit and receive them right then. It's available to any any believer. But they're received by faith. What, what do you mean they're received by faith? It means that without faith, you're not going to see it happen. You have to believe it and receive it and step out in it. Did that happen for you? It did. So Richard and I were worshiping the Lord in the Home Depot parking lot. And the environment shifted. And we both noticed it. And he said to me, you see that flower right there? And there was a, like a flower bush beside the car. And he said, I want you to go over and look at the leaf and look at the flower petals and just start describing them. But don't use English when you do it. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I don't understand what you just said. What do you mean? Don't use English. I speak English. He said, I know, but just trust in your spirit that God is going to give you a language. And I want you to look at this. And when you look at God's creation, you look at the veins in these leaves and you see the, the structure in the way that it is built. And when you know that it's built by God, our creator, the creator of the universe, and I want you to look at that and look at it with majesty and honor and, uh, and wonder and thank the Lord and describe that leaf without using English. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I go over and I start looking at this leaf and, and I'm just looking at it and there's worship music in the background and I, I start to feel what he was describing. I, I start to feel this majesty for our creator, this, uh, I, this the reverence of the shape of the veins in the leaf and the way the leaf is made so that it's, it's aerodynamic and one way it soaks up water and the other way it sheds water. And, and I'm just, I'm just soaking it in. And as I'm doing that, I start to describe it and this language that comes out of my mouth, it sounds like a combination of Japanese and Russian is what it, what it, it sounded like to me. And I just started speaking it out. And um, it lasted for about five minutes. And after that, it's like this, the, the environment that had, had shifted it's like it sort of lifted, and then I was back to reality. And that was the day, April 22nd of 2018, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I have questions about that. <laughs> I, the process is, is interesting, and I think it's worth noting and documenting here, and I think people will recognize this in their own faith walk mm -hmm. of this sort of exposure to the concept of God to um, whatever causes this exploration for truth and this sort of revelation that, hey, I think God is actually real. Mm -hmm. into this place of wanting to know this God, into this place of uh, desiring what apparently is a, an available relationship and, and kind of understanding what the heck that is because that doesn't seem, seems like we're, from the distance, it seems like we're 
creating an imaginary friend that we're going to talk to and have a relationship with. <laughs> and, and I think a skeptic would say, exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but, but once that has been experienced, truly experienced, I mean, if you're um, kind of going through the motions and you're not really seeking, you're just testing. Um, yeah. I, I think that's one thing. But when you're like earnestly seeking the Creator God who you have come to either... Uh, suddenly need mm. or uh, that you through apologetics or some other means say oh my gosh I think he's real mm-hmm. um, desiring this connection with him this life this he talks in John 15 of the vine and the branches and it's a wonderful deal I'm mean, like I'm the vine you are the branches and a branch that's connected to the vine is literally receiving its life from the vine Mm -hmm. and that life pouring through it produces fruit on the other side and keeps it healthy and thriving and all these other things. But then there's a place where you get into this relationship and you say, I don't just want relationship with you. I want to like, I want you to be the king. Mm, Yeah. I want to turn it all over to you. Yeah. I want to live in a place where I fully trust you that my faith in you isn't faith hoping that you actually are real, but my faith in you is, is, is I, I hand you my life. I hand you my marriage. Yeah. I hand you my kids, my, my career, my essence. Everything about me yeah. is yours. That's relationship. That, that, that's, not, that's not just right. That's born again. Yeah. New creation. New creation. Yeah. Renewal, new, felt new. And so when you did that, a baptism accompanied that. It was your uh, sort of signal to the world, your proclamation to the world that indeed you had become a new creation. Mm -hmm. The old had been washed away and you were born, reborn, uh, a new creation. And that happened with the disciples but sometime later after the ascension was another baptism and this was a baptism of the holy spirit and from that baptism they began to experience the power of god Mm -hmm and even be agents for the power of God working in this world. So with Jesus' ascension, he now lives, he's not outside of them, hanging out with them, talking to them, he's now inside of them. And it is by that power and authority that he does the thing, that they do the things that they do. Yeah. But I think we, 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 as Christians, we can all evaluate it for ourselves, and I think we should all ask the question is, where did I stop? Where did I stop? Did I, did I, did I, I check a box agreeing with the belief that God is, exists, and, um, and maybe I, I did a baptism to, to do that, but never really entered relationship with God? Do I have a relationship with God? Did I stop did I stop at relationship with God? I think is relationship with God, with God is good. We need relationship. It is a trademark of Christianity that, that is different than all other religions. Yeah. But did we turn it all over to him? Did we stop before we actually gave him our lives? And if we've given him our lives, which is wonderful, and if you have truly given him your life and turned it over to him, you know a peace and fulfillment now that is hard for you to describe. You would des- describe it as a peace beyond all understanding. Yeah. But there is, an, there is still more, is what you're saying. There is a baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit that is further transformative that, that puts you in a place where you are now a vessel for the power of God to operate in this world in ways that you didn't before. And if you want an understanding of what some of those 
things are. Not an exhaustive list, I don't think, but sort of what's known as gifts of the Spirit or spiritual gifts, gifts that are maybe indicative of baptism in the Holy Spirit found in 1 Corinthians 12. Mm-hmm. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For one, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. Now this is the English Standard Version. If I pulled out the New American Standard over here, it would be... Um, uh, Words of word of wisdom mm-hmm. to another, the utterance of knowledge. Mm-hmm. That would say the word of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, interpretation of tongues. This is a listing that Paul is offering the Corinthians as indications of baptism in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. What you talk about receiving in the Home Depot parking lot. And your first entrance into that was a prayer language. A speaking in a tongue. Yeah. Ask you this. Did you make that up? Did you manufacture it? No. No. And, and I know that there is, um, I know that there is skepticism around that. It's, um, I, I, I spent a little bit of time in this in the book talking about it. It's a curiosity to me that there is such pushback against things that are given freely by God to us, his children. Um, To be honest, I don't completely understand it. I I don't understand what the pushback is. I I know that there are religious traditions. I know that there are, um, you know, religious leaders denominationally that either agree or disagree with uh, certain things in Scripture, but um, I want I want to take just a moment and read Acts two chapter uh, two verse one and the first couple of uh, first couple of scriptures in Acts two to sort of frame what's going on here. Right? Yeah, Pentecost, right? So the when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they began to speak other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Um, The the vision of the of what takes place here with the the rushing mighty wind and so forth um, is is what happened in this particular incident. Um, but the way that God puts a gift on you is God's prerogative, right? I mean, it's it's um, I I think that people tend to get sometimes. Um, uh, a, a term that I, I'm familiar with is wrapped around the axle. You know, they get they get all twisted and tied up about the way that things yeah. may be done. Yeah. Um, looking past the fact that the thing done was scriptural, but the way that it was done doesn't fit your theology or it doesn't fit your supposition of the way that you think things should be done. And I think that what I've what I've discovered over the years is that just because something is extra biblical does not make it anti biblical mm. necessarily. Right. Right. So, in other words, there are things that God will do and can do that um, may not directly line up with Scripture and verse about the way that that something has been done in the past. It doesn't make it heresy or unbiblical. Unless it disagrees with Scripture, that's right. different. Yeah, right? disagreeing versus something that's not 
actually written. Yeah, something in there. contrary to Scripture, that's a different matter altogether. Sure. But something in agreement with Scripture that gets from point A to point B in a different route yeah. than, than what is uh, explicitly laid out in Scripture, mm-hmm. at the very least, I think it warrants uh, further inquiry rather mm. than um, what is often just dismissed um, by you know, religious tradition or whatever. So um, the, the reason that I bring that up is my experience may very well be different from yours. And you may hear somebody else that has a different experience. Um, I have a friend that was a 19-year-old atheist in college, and he was woken up at 3 in the morning out of a dead sleep, baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Yanked him from atheism in the middle of the night into speaking in tongues. <laughs> That's aggressive. It's aggressive. But, you know, I guess the skeptic yeah. would say, you know what? The guy has been having some cool religious moments. Um, I know you're like, that, that'd be like the last words you would want to use there. Yeah. And was so uh, caught up in the atmosphere that, uh, and wanted so badly to experience a you know, a gift of the Spirit that he sort of manufactured a language and spoke in it, and voila, he's <laughs> been baptized in the Holy Spirit. How is your experience different than that? Um, well, for my friend Jim, who had that experience when, when he was 19 and, and a non-believer, um, I, I don't recall him seeking it out. Um, I think that he was, he had some health issues and he was mad, um, at who he thought God was. Um, and God reached out to him in a, in a merciful way and introduced himself to him. For me, I was aggressively seeking the Lord. Right. You know, I mean, I was pressed into it. And you weren't caught up in the moment. Chasing after him. Wanting to speak in tongues and kind of did it yourself, but that was the Holy Spirit speaking through you. No, of course I was caught up in the moment, and I was and I was trying to seek everything that God has available for me. But uh, it wasn't something that I made up. Yeah. And um, I think that there's um, there's an opinion on faith that in order for something to be from God, He has to make it happen. Right. Right. Again, against your will, even just yeah. it, God's just yeah. going to exercise His sovereignty and and make something happen, which He can do. I want to be clear that 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 is that is an option. But God didn't build an ark; He told Noah to do it. Right? God didn't slay Goliath; He told David to do it, or He He empowered David to do it. Um. Moses was crying out to God on the banks of the Red Sea, and God says, why do you cry out to me? Hold out your staff and part the sea. There comes a time when we are expected to step out in faith. Mm. We're expected to use our faith. We're expected to hold out our staff and say, part the sea. Um. There are times when God will come to you in your dorm room and just wake you up and baptize you in the Holy Spirit. That is absolutely true. Um, but God's more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think as as I... Um, I like absolutes. I really like black and white. And, and gray area is something that's difficult for me. But God lives in the gray area. And so it's a challenge. The more that you, the more that you try and paint a black and white box around God, the more He's going to prove to you that He doesn't belong in a box. I'm discovering that that my relationship with the Lord. I'll, I'll try and keep it specific to me because everybody's relationship with the Lord is different. Just like every marriage is different. My relationship with the Lord. I am discovering that every time that I think I've got something absolutely figured out. <sighs> I am shown grace about something different. And it is, it's a real challenge to me to try and put God in a box. 
and yet I keep trying to do it, and I should know better. But um, he's just going to be bigger than whatever box you try and put him in. And um, the box oftentimes is what leads to religion. Yeah, our, our desire for uh, f- the familiar and the comfortable and the routine. Yeah. Um, what happened in your life after the baptism in the Holy Spirit? How did life change? Um, my faith was lifted to another level. the The reason that um, the reason that I named my ministry Mark Eleven Ministries is because I was overtaken by the scripture of Mark eleven twenty three, where um, Jesus had been walking along with the disciples and um, he saw he was hungry and he saw a fig tree and there was no fig available to eat and he responded by cursing the tree it was it's an interesting scripture he spoke to the tree and said from henceforth you will never produce fruit for anyone ever again and Peter witnessed him doing this. So they went on to Capernaum, um, or Jerusalem, I forget where, uh, which one. But um, the next day, they come back by, and that same tree is now shriveled up and dead. And, and Peter says to him, Master, look, that tree that you cursed, it's dead. And Jesus said, this is Mark eleven twenty three: 23, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be cast into the sea and believes in his heart and does not doubt, he shall have whatsoever he says. There's all kinds of faith scriptures in, in, uh, in the Gospels, right, about um, speaking to a problem, speaking to sickness, um, speaking to blindness uh, and telling it to, to, to be healed. Um, but the, the imagery of speaking to a mountain and a theologian will look at that and they'll say, that's not a literal mountain. You know, it's, it's a, it's an allegory, right? Well, that may be true, but if you're not reading it as if it's a real actual granite mountain, you've missed the point entirely. That is the power of the spoken word of faith backed by absolute belief and a lack of unbelief in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he can do and will do. And that scripture just, it, it stuck on me. Like in, in Florida, we got sticker burrs, you know, we got these, Mm -hmm. these stickers that you walk in, we walk through the sand on the beach, you know, get one stuck in your foot and it's horrendous. Yeah. (laughs) But that, uh, that scripture, Mark 11, 23 and 24, stuck on me like a sticker burr. I just couldn't shake it. And I was like, man, look at, look at that faith. Look at faith that moves mountains. I had a guest on here that prayed that prayer with a group of people. Yeah. They were in uh, Ireland. Her name is Pam Haynes, incredible person of faith in episodes called The Power of the Holy Spirit. She describes a time when they were there and they were doing a tour and there was this giant cliff over there. And it was... Um, notorious uh, the tour guide or whoever would, they were with a friend it's where people would go and commit suicide they would jump off of this mm. cliff yeah and so she and her husband and another couple all really strong believers say well let's let's test that and the, so they went through this time of personal repentance of any unforgiveness they cleanse themselves of these things and and in the name of Jesus commanded the mountain fall into the sea <laughs> wow two days later you know they gone back to wherever they, headline newspaper whatever's called devil's peak yeah falls into sea praise God <laughs> wow she told me that story, and I tell you, I get chills now just thinking about it. I She's got a, chills now just as you brought it, yeah. She is a person of just tremendous faith. Her name is Pam Haynes, and and uh, you should listen to that episode. I think it's number 
41. I can't remember exactly, but um, yeah, she actually prayed that. It's the first time I've ever heard that someone grabbed that scripture and said, we're praying for this mountain to be cast into the sea. So before you move on, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I want to add to that because that, that raises a good point uh, to me too, that people can often get up on the timing of an answered prayer and get hung up on, um, I just prayed it. Why didn't it happen right now? Right. Mm -hmm. She prayed against that mountain and two days later it fell into the sea. Right. Now a skeptic might look at that prayer and an hour later. Yeah. See exactly. Right. I told you. Yeah. It's, it's all so a bunch silly. of nonsense, yeah. right? Yeah. But two days later, it falls in the sea. I see that same thing with healing, um, that uh, I've seen people get prayer for healing, and they feel no different. You know, they come into the situation feeling whatever, you know, feeling sick. Um, they get prayer. They leave the situation still feeling sick. But they come back a week later and say, everything's gone. It's yeah. all gone. I went to the doctor and, the, and got a scan, and the scan shows it's gone. You that's know? interesting, yeah. That's interesting. And I've heard that from people uh, that have been active prayer healers. I guess we read in Scripture, and when Jesus did it, it was like on the spot. And um, Who knows, though? There's so many things that John even mentions it in, in the Gospel of John, that there's so many more things that actually occurred that it— it would fill volumes uh, to try to capture it all. So we're literally only getting a fraction of what actually happened in Jesus' day. Well, even Jesus prayed for some people more than once, right? The blind man. Oh, that's he prayed, a powerful He, he prayed deal. for the blind man, and the, after the first prayer, he said, I see men walking as trees. Like trees, yeah. And then he prayed for him a second time, and all of his I've always been fascinated by that. You know, there's two things that, that Jesus marveled at. He marveled at big faith. Mm-hmm. And he marveled at big unbelief. Yeah. He marveled at the faith of the centurion in Matthew 18 that knew authority so well that he told Jesus, you don't even have to come home with me to pray for my servant. If you'll just speak the words only, I know he will be healed. And Jesus was like, look at the faith on this guy. Yeah. I, <laughs> right? I haven't even seen that in Israel. Not or, even my own people see that. When the when the author of life is marveling at something, you, you got to stand at attention. It's like, what right? calls him to marvel? Yeah. Right. So <laughs> the other thing that he marveled at was that story in Matthew 9. I think it's 9. It's Matthew 9 or Matthew 13 about um, going to his hometown. And it said that he could not do many miracles except that he healed a few people. And it was because of their unbelief. So unbelief can get in the way even of Jesus. Yeah, it is 13, like you said. Is it thir um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, the end of the chapter. Yeah, so uh, it, 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 unbelief is like kryptonite uh, to, pardon, pardon the reference, but it, it, it gets in the way of the workings of God. The kingdom of heaven operates on faith. It is the fuel of heaven, faith. And faith is a substance. We know that from Hebrews 11. It's the substance of things hoped for. And that word hope in Hebrews 11, this is interesting. I just did a video on this the other day. Hope in the Greek means confident expectation. The way that we use hope in the English vernacular and just daily use is very whimsical. You know, it's like, I hope it doesn't rain today. You know, I hope well, I get... I really wish. I really wish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, really, I hope I make it to work on time, right? Like, it's totally yeah. out of my control. But biblical hope is actually confident expectation. So when I say, I hope I get healed of cancer, biblically, that is, I have the confident expectation that I'm going to be healed of cancer. That's good. So that same scripture, uh, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. So did these things start happening after you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? You had a, you, you, I, if I remember correctly, you also had uh, an occasion where you felt like you were given some type of 
um, a spiritual vision for discernment. You were walking through a store, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. So, what um, was that about? Describe that. That was um, that was an interesting weekend, <laughs> actually. That was in uh, early December of uh, eighteen, I think. It was right around one year after I got born again, and it was about eight months or so after I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, I had, from the time that I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, through that summer, um, I had uh, I had an incident where uh, I had gotten, I was getting sick. I was developing the symptoms of strep throat. So I had a, a fever coming on. I had all the, you know, the broken glass in your throat, kind mm-hmm. of, you know, and, you know, all that. Those symptoms were coming on me. And I had been just binge watching content about the authority of the believer in Christ mm-hmm. and understanding the, um, that we have been given authority over sickness and disease through the blood of Christ, right? So... I've been binge watching all of this stuff and I start getting the symptoms of sickness coming on me. And I was, I was going along with it, you know, just being in the normal way that people do. Uh, you, you get a, you get a snotty nose and a cough and you say, Oh, I'm taking a cold, you know, or whatever. It's, it's what people do. And I was doing the same thing. I was laid up on the couch and had blankets on and it was summertime, you know? (laughs) And, and, uh, I remember I, I was I was listening to this this teaching on the authority as it relates to sickness, and um, I just realized the Holy Spirit brought it to my gave me the revelation. I don't have to be sick. I don't have to receive this thing that's coming on me. So I got up off the couch and I walked into the bathroom and I looked at myself in the mirror. And I was speaking in this moment. I was me, the spirit of Steve Russell, was speaking to my body, the flesh of Steve Russell. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you be healed right now. All sickness and disease come out. Loose your grip and be gone, not to never to return again. Every symptom that came on, go now and be well in Jesus' name. And I walked away from the mirror and I went back and, and laid on the couch, still feeling lousy. But within an hour, every one of those symptoms was gone. All of the the fever, the scratchy throat, all all the stuff that was giving me misery on the couch before I prayed that prayer, an hour later, it was all gone. Praise God. And that was my first real prayer in expectation was on myself. You look like you want to say something. No, I'm. Okay. I, I, I have okay. obviously questions, and and so, so when I have that summer crud, <laughs> I, right. I, I try not to have any interviews scheduled around that because I know I will not get my voice back fully uh, correctly for a good three weeks. Hmm. I'm gonna be suffering with congestion of some kind for at least two. I guess my point is those things typically for me don't quickly disappear as they are emerging. There is a full-blown process they have to go through um, to run their course, so to speak, before they're gone. And for one of those occurrences to quickly disappear uh, an hour later, is uh, that doesn't happen. So um, there's, uh, scripturally, uh, there is milk drinking and there is meat eating when yeah. it comes when it comes to a walk with Christ right and the the milk drinking is is the the simple the the very black and white uh, gospel message uh, the meat eating is the real get your get your hands dirty teaching of the word of God and the will of God and and the understandings of um, what he has set aside for us right so I lay that out because I'm about to say something that's going to be a, it, some people might choke on it because it's a little bit of meat. Good. You do not have to be sick. I'll let that just resonate for a second. But you can come into agreement with the illness or you can come into agreement with the promises of God. And God will honor your faith on both sides. 
What do we have to do to not be sick? Well, for starters, agreeing with the promises of God that by his stripes we are healed is, is where you start with it. Um, in Isaiah 53, it talks about the coming uh, Messiah will take the, by his stripes, we will be healed. In Matthew, he reaffirms that by his stripes, we are healed. And then in Second Peter, Peter says, by his stripes, we were healed. So we've got an addressing of the stripes of Jesus, which is a reference to the 39 lashes uh, that he received prior to the cross. Right. right. The, the lashes and the cross, two separate things. So the, the cross was for salvation, but the lashes he received on his body was to take on the, the healing of the world, to take on the sickness of the world so that we may be healed. By his stripes, we are healed. So before, during, after, will be healed, are healed, was healed. So the question was, I'm a churchgoer, mm-hmm. uh, got baptized, um, believe in God, believe Jesus is the Son of God, um, want to be a good person, read my Bible occasionally. How, how do I get into a place in my faith where I am living out this gifts of the spirit i don't have to be sick life i don't have all the answers to everything so i can speak from what i know you have experience i do have experience i i can speak from what i know i can speak from what i've experienced and i can speak from opinion based on all of those. Okay. So, um, having said that, I think that humility is very important in growing with the Lord. Um, in order to go high, you must go low is what scripture says. The humble will be exalted. The exalted will be humbled. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone's walk with the Lord is different, and um, people can hear a message like what I just said, and they can receive it with joy and excitement and press into it and, and seek it, seek it out from the Lord, seek it out in Scripture and go after it, or they can hear it and get angry and, and do the, how dare you, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very easy to go either way. Um, the promises of God are yes and amen. In our country where we live, we have many blessings and benefits. Um, the The curse of wealth can sometimes be um, getting in the way of needing the Lord. And so here's what I mean by that. When we press into and seek the Lord, He is faithful. But there is also, in some ways, seeking the Lord in a way that's convenient. So... The Lord showed, would talk to me about the simple gospel, and, and one of the things that he showed me was in, let's say that you're in Africa, and you are 20 miles from a paved road, and you're 50 miles from civilization, right? You're out in the middle of nowhere. you got a little farm with a grass hut, and you and your 12-year-old boy are out there just plowing the field. And your son slips and falls and an ox steps on him creating a catastrophic wound and there is no there's no 911 there's no medevac there's no helicopter that's coming can you 
scripturally support the idea that you can get on your knees and call out to God, God save my son, and expect him to do it? I want to answer that yes, but I don't know that I can answer that yes. That's, that's an honest answer. Praise God. So um, scripturally, the answer would be yes, mm-hmm. because you are praying within his will. It is not God's will that a 12-year-old would get stepped on by an ox and die in a, in a, in a crop field. That's... I mean, we could go down a different path and and scripturally cross-reference that, but it's not. So if you are praying in accordance with God's will and you believe that he will do it, you can have whatsoever you believe. That is scripturally supported. Mark 11, 23 is, is backing for that, you know, speaking to the mountain and having it cast into the sea. But all through the gospels, you can see um, Jesus and the way that he ministers healing. And then we see that John fourteen twelve, Jesus says that we can do the same things that he did, right? If you come to the Father and anything that you ask in my name, I will do it. He says it three times in that, in that scripture. Anything you ask in my name, I will do it, that it may glorify the Father. So, can a farmer pray for his son to be healed in the middle of nowhere and expect it to be done? Is that scripturally supported? The answer is yes. So, if that can happen in the middle of nowhere in Africa, in a farm with a grass hut, can it happen when you've got a level one trauma center across the street? It can. Mm -hmm. But people pray for these things all the time, and... Our mortality rate on cancers and mm-hmm. trauma and all these other things in the face of prayer. People in desperate situations with a loved one who has a terminal brain tumor or uh, has experienced trauma through an accident or uh, uh, stage four cancer. Mm-hmm. And people praying, believing in their heart that it will happen and it not happening is sort of what gets held up as, so why didn't it happen? Yeah. So again, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to please, I'm going to put out the disclaimer that this is meat and this is not milk. So um, the hard answers are sometimes they're tough to swallow, but we have to remove religion and experience out of the way and give the answer to that question scripturally. And scripturally, it says, if you believe and you do not doubt, you will have whatsoever you say. So somebody's lying. Either scripture's lying or the person praying is not being truthful, but you can't have it both ways. If you pray and you believe and you do not doubt, you will have whatsoever you say. Have you prayed and believed for something that should not have happened and it did happen? Should not have happened by the world standards, by natural standards? Um, I have prayed for things that have not uh, come to fruition. Yeah. And what's your conclusion as to why that didn't happen? Uh, well, it either, either I was praying against God's will or I was praying with doubt in my heart. But that you've would, had, that would be my conclusion, but you've had instances mm-hmm. where you've prayed with what you believe is no doubt in faith. And you've seen those things happen. I'm saying that if I pray for something and it didn't happen scripturally, it's either not in God's will or I have doubt in my heart or I did not believe it. 
Yeah, but you know, we I think the prayer of healing is that we believe that it is God's will that we have life abundant and that mm-hmm. sickness and disease and and those things uh, we are going to die we know that it's, right. it doesn't prevent death every you know we're going to die at appropriate time but for the fallen world to claim us with disease and sickness feels like it's outside the will of god and so how would that be god's will then at that point you're saying well there must have been doubt Doubt or unbelief. Unbelief. Yeah. That's an aggressive, I mean, that's an abrupt, I mean, and and you and I sitting here is one thing, but the grieving mother who lost her 13-year-old child. Yep. And prayed her brains out for weeks and months. Yeah. It's hard to, and and that's why I, when when I say things like that, I want I want to say it in uh, with um, with due care and um, and respect. But God's word is what it is, and it's either it's either all true or none of it's true. And I think that um, it's important to really understand the character of God um, in, in, through relationship and, and prayer and expectations and um, life is messy, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, kids getting car wrecks, moms get cancer. You know this life is messy, but scripturally, when we come back to the foundation of the Word, if you pray and you believe and do not doubt in your heart, you will have whatsoever you pray. If if it is according to the will of God. Yeah, it is not God's will that anyone would be sick. Yeah, and that we know because Jesus Christ was the visible image of the invisible God. And so, if we want to know how God would act in a situation, then we look at how Jesus acted, and in whatever situation that Jesus acted in, that's the way the Father would act because He was the express visible image of the invisible God. Yeah, and there were many instances where he healed everyone that was brought to him, and there were I, there were instances where he walked past people that probably could have used some healing to heal one person, which I find interesting. And uh, and I think the skeptic would say, well, it's that's a convenient out that we can also lump in there if it's not God's will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, why would it? not be God's will to heal a child of cancer. That's just a, that's a hard thing for us humans to <laughs> grasp, you know, and, and, and I think where I really want to get to is, is less of a debate on um, praying healing that doesn't happen and whether people have faith enough and we should pray for an increase of faith and, and you know, what really is that? How, what's the measure and mark of that? But what I... And maybe that's is the same place that I'd like to go. Is I, I want people to be aware of the more that is a baptism in the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and operating in the will and exercising the authority and the power that God manifest in this world through people that are believers. Mm-hmm. First of all, the fact that it exists. And I'm sitting across the table from a guy who has been in situations personally where he, in fact, has been an agent for the manifestation of that power through healing and deliverance of people. You not only have seen it and been in proximity of that, but you've actually 
been the agent yourself mm-hmm. many times. And, and, and getting over this hump of, well, that's just not real for me. Or that's only for the super anointed. That's not for everyday average Joe Christian. That's people that God's maybe specially, this the Billy Grahams of the world or whoever else that he's specially called out with an anoint, anointing for that. Yeah. That's not for just a just a person of faith or a Christian. Well, scripturally, it's for the believer, and that's for all of us. So it's it, for it's for the believer. So if you if you believe, it's for you. If you don't believe, it's not for you. It doesn't it doesn't um, it uh, it's not for you if you're not a believer. So maybe we need to check our temperature on our level of whether we actually believe that all the things that we read in this book. The existence of God, the the belief yeah. that Jesus is the Son of God and was actually resurrected from the dead and actually did these things. Maybe there's some unbelief mixed in there that we may not have sort of addressed. I think that um, when when you get to the the revelation that um, God is who he says he is and Jesus Christ is who he said he was and we receive not not academically right but we receive in a heart knowledge as the truth of who Jesus right. is it changes everything. That's that's what changes everything. And I think when when people um, tend to get, um, I'll call it sideways, you know, about they they want to really argue with you about uh, about some of the stuff that we're discussing. It's because they're arguing from a point of view of their own experience or their own religious box that they have always lived in, and. Um, God will not fit in your box. He just won't. And um, so the the truth of uh, of God's word is it's tough to swallow for religious people because they like to put God in this little box. And um, God makes some promises that we all have access to. But if I put a gift on the counter over there and had it all tied up and, and have a bow put on it, and I've got a name tag on it that has your name and the gift is sitting over there, but if you never walk over and look at the tag on it, you may see that gift sitting over there, but you don't even know it belongs to you. You know what I mean? Hmm. And that doesn't mean that the the gift isn't yours but you could walk right past it and hop in your car and go home and and not even not even give it another thought and at some point down the road i say to you hey what did you think about so and so what are you talking about i i said i left you that gift you know didn't you didn't you get it but if you never even look at it as if it's yours you know if you never even flip the tag over and see whose name is on this gift then the gift was provided for you. You just didn't receive it. So what is your message? What, what are we missing? What do we need to do? What, what have you experienced that you wish other people would experience? I think, I, I think my message is um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because from those two commandments, every other commandment is justified. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's the simplicity. And when um, when when we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, um, just by example, lean into the relationship, Le- push forward, and lean into it. You know, like when you're first getting married, and and you're in your first or second or third year of marriage, lean into it. 
I mean, don't don't just get uh, don't just get another sweater for the third year for her birthday. You know, lean into what is it she really wants. You know, what is it that that you know about your spouse that nobody else knows, right? That's the, that's the kind of desire that I'm talking about, about seeking relationship with the Lord is leaning into it in the way that, that only you would do because it's your relationship with God. Somebody else is going to have a different relationship, but your relationship is your responsibility. Just like your marriage is your responsibility, you know? So, um, I would say humble yourself. I wish more people uh, would, myself included, uh, clear our cookies, man. <laughs> you know, and yeah. um, and and open the possibilities to the way God truly moves, rather than the ways that tradition has tried to make it uh, a lot more digestible to be in community. And um, I'm having more and more guests on here who are living out this version of relationship and baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it's cool, and it's faith-building to me. And, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you I, I, I have to recommend the book that you wrote. And uh, assuming all of it's true, <laughs> knowing you now, I, I have a mutual friend, um, uh, Chris McKinney, who, who is a Christian um, publisher, uh, He's the one who recommended the book. I think he published it for you. He did, yeah. Which is uh, uh, also good. But um, coming out of cold, dead religion and into relationship with the living God, Awakening by Steve Russell, um, you need to read it. I've read it twice, and I'm going to read it again. It, I, I felt the movement and power of the Holy Spirit in that, and it has increased my belief. It has increased my faith. It has increased the conviction that I feel to... Um, to go beyond where we are in my own faith walk. Uh, that conviction has been there for a while, and, um, and, and this book is, is legit on these things, and it's the account of, of one guy's experiencing the very things I desire, and I pray that more of us, I believe it's happening. Yeah. I, I believe it's happening. I believe I'm seeing it more and more. I do too. In our culture, of of people are like, hey, I'm 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 done with this um, this stale, cold, non living, just belief system mm -hmm. that I have I have adapted. It's not a belief system. It's a relationship, and it's alive, and it is life changing, and it is not made up, and it's experience, and it's power. Yeah, and Amen. Scripture tells us its power, and when we don't believe its power for us, we're getting it wrong. And um, I'm tired of getting it wrong. So, Steve Russell, I, it feels like we could go for like five more hours here, and maybe we just need to do that um, soon. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm uh, honored to uh, be asked to be here. I give all glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I did not author that book by myself. <laughs> Praise God. Um, it is it is my story, but it was authored by the Holy Spirit for sure. Yeah. Um, so I am, uh, I just live daily in gratitude, man. It's just really humbling to walk with the Lord in, in whatever way that I can. And uh, um, yeah, praise God. I pray that anyone that, uh, anyone that reads this book I pray that they are touched by it. I pray that the Lord moves mightily in their lives. And um, I just bless you in Jesus' name. I've read a lot of books and a lot of good books, and I've enjoyed them. This one, this one was uh, more transformative in nature. And um, I, I, I just recommend that, that people pick that up. This, this podcast was not about the book. This podcast was about the presence of God moving from a place of inquiry all the way yeah. through connection, relationship, fully turning it over in baptism in the Holy Spirit. And if, if you have gotten stuck in one of those places, I encourage you to get unstuck, clear your cookies, and go 
and go dig for more. And so Steve Russell couldn't have asked for a better person to start with video. And so thank you for being here, bud. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. Steve Russell is an everyday guy who chose to truly seek the living God. And in that search, God revealed himself to Steve in powerful ways that have awakened Steve to realities he could have never imagined before. I say all this because the exact thing is available to all of us. It's not called good news for nothing. Wherever you are in your faith, I think Steve would encourage you to not stop. Dig deeper. Learn more. Challenge the things that restrict your spirit, including your religious traditions. And ask your Heavenly Father to reveal Himself to you. Because if you do, the experiences that lie ahead are far greater than anything you could ever imagine. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. To get Steve's book, Awakening, coming out of cold, dead religion and into a relationship with the living God, click the link in our episode description. Also, if you know of someone who might make a good guest for us, or if you feel like you may be called to support our ministry, please visit astrongerfaith.org. And if you're watching on YouTube, we encourage you to click the subscribe button right in the corner. That'll give you the opportunity to see all of our interviews, plus a lot of our short clips that we designed uh, that contain some of our more powerful moments. Until next time, we pray for peace and an even stronger faith for you and those you love.